Nice work chatting to new people for folks who engaged in that. And just want to start off. People might still be arriving, but by welcoming everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really so delighted to be here with you all. I wasn't here last week and yeah, and I kept being like, wait, is there something I'm supposed to do? <laughs> um, and it definitely, yeah, felt like something was missing. So it's great to be back. I hope feeding your demons was eventful. Demons, they just keep coming. So I am sure there was work to do. And yeah, really delighted to be continuing our path. Uh, Ron asked me the other day, how long have we been on this book? And I was like, I, I think it's about six months now. Um, yeah, at least five. And uh, yep, we got a little more. Um, but it's, it's such a lovely time to be sharing <clears throat> the stories together. And for folks who haven't been here, no worries at all. This book is a compiled set of stories about the historical life of the Buddha. So the kind of very basics of how he grew up and how he found his way to the path. And then we're in the you know part of the book now where you really see the first 10 years after he was enlightened and how he's spreading his teachings and a lot of the struggles, like very human, very normal struggles that arise. The last time we gathered together, it was uh, when the Buddha's at the point in the story in which the Buddha's own father um, was dying. And what was it like for the Buddha to be with that process and super touching uh, the book and stories are compiled by the late and great Thich Nhat Hanh, such a wonderful teacher. And often on Wednesday nights, we follow much more in a Mahayana and Vajrayana tradition, but just really lovely to have an opportunity to work with the words of Thich Nhat Hanh. So I'm Eve Ekman. I'm one of the teachers who is here Wednesdays. Also, we have Lopan Chandra Easton, who has had some things preventing her from coming in person for a while, but we remain hopeful that she will return and join us. And yeah, it's um, really uh, a sweet a sweet experience to continue to follow these, these stories of the Buddha. And, and this evening, um, just as a little idea of what we're gonna get into, there's actually, there's an interesting aspect of some of the difficulties that can arise in the context of groups, as even spiritual groups, even spiritual groups who get to follow the Buddha with conflict, um, challenges, people disagreeing, people um, having other ideas about how this organization should be run. It, it felt very normalizing that even the Buddha and his Sangha had a lot of these struggles that many of us face in our work life and our home life and yeah, it's a it's a really nice opportunity, I think, tonight, especially to look at forgiveness. So that was a theme I, I brought up for us to talk about. And before we get started, I just want to kind of honor this container of the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So this is an entirely volunteer run center. There's some amazing volunteers and board members here. And what that means is this center is literally living and resting upon generosity. So folks who wanted this center to happen invite teachers who are lucky like myself to be here and to create a place where we can practice together. So I'm sitting in this side of the room, but the idea is in the context of the Dharma Collective, we are here to learn together. And in order to learn together, we actually have to honor and respect one another with a lot of the tenets that are kind of woven into Buddhist practice. And those tenets include our ability to mindfully listen to one another and to be compassionate in how we are listening to what's being shared. And also to apply our practice in how we are sharing compassionately. Those parts can feel somewhat easy, like, okay, I'm listening. I can maybe listen with a bit of an open heart, not leaning in and frowning. You know, I can share from part of my, you know, deeper being or part of my more settled self. But I even invite you in our time here together to try to have thoughts that are imbued with compassion, that your breath, like each one could have some sense of that trace of compassion. 
it's just such an amazing opportunity, this little laboratory of being together and practicing together. So I encourage us to take advantage of that. And it is so useful to be able to hear from one another about our reflections on practice, our reflections on the teachings uh, in these texts. But to do so, there has to be some level of respect and honoring of one another. So just wanting to really surface that before we get started, that one of the biggest values of the Dharma Collective is folks could come here and and feel welcome and feel valued, um, feel seen. We can't guarantee that, but that is our aspiration. So for all of us here tonight, whether it's your first time or you've been coming as long as we've been open, yeah, just holding that in your heart as part of our aspiration. So we will start with the meditation, but I do want to kind of preamble a little bit on our theme tonight around compassion and forgiveness. Oh boy, it's a, it's a hard one. And um, I think, I don't know about some of you in this room, whenever a teacher would say like, tonight we're going to talk about forgiveness. I used to really be like, where's the door? <laughs> like I'm out of here. I'm, I'm good. It, it can be a really tough and, and tricky topic for some of us, um, not only because of our personal experiences, but because sometimes when we say forgiveness and when we talk about the practice of forgiveness, it can sound as though we think it's okay that harm is done. And it's, it's not. When we have forgiveness, it is not we accept it or allow it. It's a sense really of recognizing the complexity of the harms that may be done. It is recognizing just the whole scope of everything that may be challenging to us or challenging to others. So when we think of forgiveness, it it can be easier to start with something a little smaller, maybe not a, a really tense situation with a colleague or family member, but something that's a little more average and everyday. Um, I know that one thing that can come up and make us feel quite aggrieved, quite frustrated, or um, quite sad is when we feel like we're not being seen or heard. We feel like we're being either kind of mistreated through that or disrespected through that. So everyone here had an experience of really not feeling seen or heard and, and that creating a sense of frustration. And that person who isn't seeing or hearing us, it is really easy to make them wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Really easy and very easy to feel right. Like, I think that happens like quite quickly. Um, And I think there's, yeah, just a really interesting piece I've been noticing for myself in these last couple of weeks, I've had a a heightened um, sense of when I feel wronged, how quickly that sense of rightness just shows up. And that the idea of this other person who I feel wronged by having any capacity at all, like I think of them as a a wrong, bad person, kind of almost like they don't even deserve my care and consideration. And forgiveness feels almost too grand for that kind of just being annoyed with someone who I think is wrong. But there's that that same flavor of forgiveness is needed no matter what the experience is. And there's so many, I'd say, small ways that happen to us if if we are in the world and engaging with other people that we feel wronged. We feel unseen. We feel unheard. We feel like we've been disrespected. It happens all the time. And it's very easy to very quickly dismiss that person. And we just don't think of them again. Sometimes if we're lucky, we don't have to see that person and they're dismissed and they're out of our mind. Right. So let's say we have an encounter um, just out in the street or at a restaurant that's difficult. We're like, that person's crazy. Who cares? Moving on. But then there's the people that we have to continue to see over and over And when we hold that kind of grievance, when we hold that kind of, yeah, I will show up and I'll smile because I have to, but like, I think you're wrong. In fact, I know you're wrong and you're hurtful and I'm right. It is such an intense energy when we start to pay attention to it. It's like a wall that we build inside of ourselves. 
And one of these stories that we'll be looking at tonight, there's like a series of stories we'll be looking at at this phase of the, the Buddha Sangha, where they've been 10 years in. So they've had the Buddha for a while, but they've gotten big, right? If, at first there was just five, then a hundred, then 500. And now there's, you know, different groups of Sangha members everywhere. And they are like little organizations, right? And within the organizations, there's hierarchy. There are this, the, the precept masters. There are the sutra masters. They have different jobs and roles. There's the senior students. There's the lower students. And in one of the stories, there's a really small disagreement. I mean, really small. The precept master forgets to wash his, you know, his bowl and the sutra master calls him out on it. But the pride of that other, you know, kind of precept master is so great that he's like, I didn't actually, I didn't mean to clean that bowl. So it's, I didn't do anything wrong. And they get in this, this fight. Um, it's so senseless in one of the larger gatherings of the Buddha Sangha. And it goes on for months and months and months. And many times the Buddha visits them and is like, you should be focusing on your practice and not your grievance towards this other person. Just do that. And I think he didn't quite appreciate for a number of months, almost a year, that when anger clouds the mind, when anger and like resentment and frustration has really sunk in, you might need a little more than just focusing on your breath. Ideally, we could. We could just focus on the breath. It would be enough. But often we need a more precise instrument, something that can really help us narrow in on those feelings of frustration and loosen them. So tonight we're going to pack practice with a, a little bit of that more refined or specific instrument. And that is one of compassion. And often I think we bring compassion towards someone we're having a difficulty with before we've brought that compassion to ourselves. That doesn't usually go well. That compassion we try to impose on someone who we're still mad at is not very good compassion. It's kind of brittle and dry and rigid. And we're like, yeah, I care about your suffering. Okay, I understand you have all these other issues. That's probably why you're acting this way. We don't feel it. And it's not really landing in us as an embodied practice, as a true felt practice. Um, and I, I've had a, a couple opportunities to work with this in the last couple of weeks, some experiences that have felt annoying and, uh, and hurtful, right? I mean, there's one thing about not being seen and heard if we didn't care, but that kind of experience that creates the frustration or the resentment towards another person is because we feel hurt. And to just stop for a moment at that part of, wow, this kind of hurts. And I'm mad at this person. And I think they did this wrong, right? And hanging out for a bit of time in the sense of our own hurt before we go ahead and try to apply compassion. The ultimate goal, always creating this mind that has enough peace that we can be of service to others and be more present in our life. But sometimes it's, it's funny, we forget the plot, we forget the best steps there. So when we've been hurt and someone else hurt us, it's like, they're bad and I'm using my discernment to know they're bad and I'm gonna keep my distance from them, but we don't really take into account our own hurt and we're not able then to open with compassion towards them. And uh, you see, it's, it's interesting, a, a part of this, the teachings tonight is, you know, the Buddha came up with this elaborate seven step way of like managing conflict. But I think one of the most important parts of all of it is for both parties to recognize this is creating more harm than good. Whoever is right, whoever is wrong, this is, just, this is just disturbing the mind. There's no peace in this mind where we have this kind of conflict going on. And I especially think, you know, our conflict with just one other person is such a microcosm for how we could even imagine managing conflict at the global level, which feels um, much harder and much bigger. But I think actually these one-on-one -on -one personal conflicts, they can give us a good 
inspiration or idea of how we could have that possibility for resolving conflict and difficulties at a larger level. So we're going to essentially make world peace tonight through our meditation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's enough of a preamble. Um, I know some folks just came and if anybody needs a cushion, there's maybe one left over there. Some blankets. We'll be practicing together maybe 25 or 30 minutes. And you are welcome to find the posture on the floor or on a chair that works for you. or lying down I should mention that is one of the meditation postures you risk the hazard of falling asleep which can be a really nice use of 25 or 30 minutes but if you snore we might wake you up <laughs> Taking a moment as we settle in to find a posture that can support us. A posture that feels both a sense of uprightness, almost as though we could imagine our spine as stacked gold coins. And inviting a sense of gentleness and softness through the front of the body. Softening through the eyes and the cheekbones and the jaw. Softening through the chest and the belly. Feeling a sense of this body and this posture being a perfect alignment for our practice, this uprightness and this dignity, and this softness and this openness. giving yourself this precious opportunity to let whatever else wants to be thought about or connected with, letting all of that for the moment just slip away. Giving yourself permission to fully arrive here. All your thoughts and memories and images will certainly be visiting you. But you can set as part of your internal posture, a posture of real presence and stillness.
continuing to settle into practice, we can focus on sensations in the body. Giving our mind this broader field of attention through the body and help us experience this moment. The body is always in the present. Feel the natural qualities of the body in a more settled state, grounded, present. And while there may be energy undulating through the body, invite this quality of stillness of the body. Such a beautiful discipline to find a body of stillness. So often we are moving around. We're simply in deep relaxation or sleep, but no vividness in the body. See if you can find this sense of stillness, presence, and vividness. For a couple more moments, just be curious again about these sensations throughout the body. Areas of coolness or warmth. Areas maybe of tingling. And find an awareness of the body from within the body. And then gently shifting and continuing to settle in by bringing a more close focus to the sensations of breath. Noticing as the breath travels in and the belly gently rises. And continue that noticing of the breath as the exhale and the belly gently falls.
Such a simple practice. It's the very foundation of developing our attention and awareness. The foundation of our freedom. So bring a level of real intention to following the entire cycle of the breath. And if we can follow the breath, it can help us settle the mind. And instead of the mind being brightened by the presence of many thoughts, memories, and image, we can find the mind illuminated by its own nature. A sense of openness and spaciousness. So we'll continue gently following the breath, settling the mind. It doesn't matter how many times we get distracted and carried away. It matters the gentleness and the kindness by which we bring our attention back. Around off this initial settling of our body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Let's take a couple slower breaths. So, releasing your next exhale, and then inhaling very slowly for an internal count of four. And gently holding at the top. And exhaling for that same amount, that same count of slow four. And doing that twice more, lengthening and extending the inhale and exhale. And taking a moment here at connecting with our intention. The intention for our practice is like a guiding light. That's an inspiration, a motivation. It helps keep us connected to our purpose. Think of an intention that is meaningful for you today for showing up here.
This could be something more personal, like wanting connection, finding peace. And then considering a greater non-local intention, an intention that connects you to the very heart of bodhicitta and the awakened heart of compassion. What is the greater purpose of your presence? Let this intention blossom maybe as a feeling, as words or image. And then gently recede, just into the background of practice, but still with us. And we'll shift our practice now into imagination and visualization. Using possibly our memory and considering a time in which we felt aggrieved, frustrated. A time in which we felt that someone had been disrespectful or unkind. This could be something recent or maybe a bit farther away. Something that's ongoing or something that is just a one-time experience. And consider working with something mid-range. Maybe if there's a real large feeling, be letting that one come later. We'll consider something that feels like an ongoing or momentary experience of conflict and challenge. Bring this to mind just vividly for a couple moments to help us make it real. What does it feel like in the body when we consider this? What are the thoughts that may start populating the mind? It can be sometimes hard to choose one thing, but try to choose just one thing in which we really notice this experience of feeling frustrated or, or hurt. And then taking a moment and really noticing if we can release this memory or this image of our feeling of conflict or difficulty and connect with the feeling in the body. Maybe we notice a heaviness in the chest or the belly. Maybe there's a sense of warmth. I'm taking a moment to notice what this might stir up. What is the simple human emotion that is evoked in this conflict or difficulty? This could feel, again, like sensations in the body, a heaviness in the heart or heat. Maybe there's something that feels more like words or a story. I feel sad or this isn't fair. See if you can allow the tenderness of the heart 
to connect with just the difficulty, the hurt of what the situation has created in your own heart. What lies beneath the blame? What lies beneath the frustration? And feel a genuine sense of warmth and welcoming, kindness and care towards whatever that feeling is right here. Really using our next breaths as breaths of compassion, ventilating the heart. As we inhale, we recognize our feelings of difficulty or hurt. And as we exhale, we extend a sense of compassion and care towards that hurt. We may find ourselves distracted or feel some sense of resistance towards tuning in. No problem. We could also apply a palm onto our chest just to have that sense of care directly towards ourselves. <laughs> And for a couple more breaths here, noticing if there's any lingering feelings or emotions of hurt in the body. And continuing to extend care and compassion on the exhale. And if there are not lingering feelings, just continuing to bring this compassionate breath throughout the body. We can consider these classic phrases to help us feel this infusion of compassion towards ourself. And on the exhale, may I know peace and ease. May I feel belonging and connection. May my heart feel at peace. Releasing the palm if it's been on the heart and releasing this image or memory and giving ourselves some moments here to reestablish the breath and the body.
And then we widen the sphere of our compassion. Going back to this feeling of challenge or difficulty with another being. We bring to mind this being, this person with whom we've had a difficulty. Maybe we feel unseen, disrespected, hurt in some way. And without going into the entire story of what has transpired, bringing to mind this being almost as though they were in front of you, noticing what it's like to invite them into the space. Maybe there's already a sense of shift or change in the body. And imagining that this being, all they want is to be free from suffering. Just like you, they want to know peace and ease. And though what has transpired may not be okay or acceptable, recognizing the value of holding this being in compassion, recognizing that they also may have areas of suffering and difficulty. Just considering once again, what it's like to bring this person into a field of care, consideration. With dropping the whole rest of the story. Whatever you think you know about this person, there is so much more that we don't know. And letting that be enough as a seed of compassion. This being just like us wants to be free. This being just like us doesn't always go about it in the best ways. And then once again, engaging the breath with our inhale, bringing to mind this being. And with our exhale, extending care and kindness and compassion. And continuing breath by breath to invite these feelings of kindness, extend these feelings of kindness. To hold someone in compassion is to hold someone in forgiveness. And there is no difference. Being able to see and care for the difficulty this person is experiencing. And find an openness of heart towards that difficulty. Just a couple more breaths here and maybe again, applying some phrases of care, kindness, bringing this person again, vividly to mind, extending this wish and aspiration. May you know connection and belonging. May you feel peace and ease. May you experience freedom from suffering.
<clears throat> gently releasing this person from our mind and allowing ourselves to rest in this body of compassion. Reconnecting to following the breath in the body. Really noticing any shifts and changes in the body. And welcoming whatever is here in the body. Thank you for your practice. I'm not gonna lie, it's a high level practice. We went straight to difficult person in our compassion practice, but we did give ourselves a little compassion first for our own experience. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from anyone reflections or questions on that practice. And if folks in the room would like to share, I invite you to uh, grab the mic, bring it back to your chair. And for folks online, um, yeah, just raise your hand. Any reflections are welcome. Also objections are welcome. Questions about if the practice in any way felt like, hmm, was I doing the right thing? Did I experience the right thing? Yeah. I guess it happened that I think I was the one who maybe was like, the mean one in the situation. Um, but I still got my feelings hurt as well in the end, but maybe it was my lack of care in the beginning mm. that sort of started the thing. Yeah. So, um, I think it was nice to start with that compassion first because I was able to sort of forgive myself because I'm still holding on to it a little bit of like, damn it, I fucked up. Mm. Um, and I wish I wouldn't have. Yeah. And, uh, so it was really nice to start with the beginning. And then I went through, I'm like, am I doing this right? Like, yeah. is this the way it should have worked? Or yeah. should I have like picked someone different Yeah. or a different experience yeah. where I was clearly wronged and I need to forgive or. Yeah. Cause it was kind of me forgiving myself in them and then the whole situation. So, yeah, I think that's beautiful. Very rarely 
And yeah, sorry to burst anyone's bubble. Very rarely is like someone actually wrong, right? <laughs> like, it's usually very co-created. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like, what was that like for you um, in the practice, like to extend that care for yourself first and then? Towards the- it was really helpful. I was really happy it went like that. Um, Cause I, I think that it was, like I said, I've been holding on to it. So it felt like I could relax a little bit yeah. and forgive myself yeah. um, for a rushed moment and a not very nice one. And, yeah. um, and to see that it wasn't all my fault right there. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have done that. It was clearly my fault and I take responsibility for it, but yeah, um, it was nice to forgive myself a little bit and to be okay with that. I'm not going to be perfect in this and I'm going to mess up. And yeah. Um, so yeah, that felt good. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. Um, we read together the beyond religion book by his holiness, the Dalai Lama a couple of years back, and he's got a couple chapters on compassion and then he leads up to forgiveness and he's like, Oh yeah, they're the same. And I had so much, I was like, no, they're different. (laughs) Forgiveness means I think it's okay. And, you know, I think for oneself too, like, what does that mean to forgive ourselves? That is a a very tough one. We all make mistakes, uh, especially like, especially when we're in a rush and needless to say, we live in a rush based culture and often, yeah, like we're not as careful or mindful or clear. And there's nothing like that feeling of thinking you're late to make you reactive emotionally to everything else around you. Right. And I just love the idea of like, how do we bring our practice, not only to try to guide how we act, but how to make room for the ways that we don't act right. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, And I think with compassion practices, especially, you know, there can be the sense of, all right, well, I'm sending compassion to them in my mind. Does that have any causal efficacy in the world? Like, what's the good of that? And like, it's just in my mind. I really think it helps with that keeping the heart open, right? Because when we have that resentment or difficulty with another person, it shuts off our empathy entirely because we've made them wrong and um, or made ourselves wrong, right? And it might not, we might not think about it every day, but I just think about it as like, just like blocking off parts of our system, you know, towards ourself with ourself and these practices, these visualizations and imaginations help to keep the heart more supple. Right. And we know when we suppress emotions, we actually, it's harder on the body. It's more energy in the body to suppress what we don't want to feel than to have this uh, ability to kind of touch it and be with it. And I think about the people we have difficulties with who maybe don't live near us, the difficulty of people who are no longer in this world. What do we do about that? Mm. We still want to like, you know, move in the heart with it, right? We don't want to let it just be this fixed thing inside of us. And I think the more we are on this path and do this work, it's like we get to be kind of, I don't know if people remember this story of the princess and the pea. Right. And the princess was so sensitive that under many mattresses, she could feel a pee. And I feel like all my grudges and grievances are like harder to be with. I used to really excel in grudges and grievances. I could like keep them going for years. And now I'm like, oh, it's uncomfortable. Like, I don't like feeling that towards someone, you know. And um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, a natural thing to realize and recognize that we are holding a lot of these right like not just a couple right am i right yes <laughs> lots of little grudges and grievances like that's a lot of pebbles <laughs> you know it's a lot of weight um yeah any anyone else any other questions yes please more of a question than a comment yeah which is when you think about forgiveness, is it more of a concept or an action or verb? And where my question is coming from, I was raised sort of in a in the Jewish tradition. And at high holy days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, 
what, putting aside whatever God means in that context, but the idea is that God will not listen to you until you have first approached the person that you need to ask forgiveness or grant forgiveness. So absent you taking that action, like don't, the Jewish guy's like, don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. You haven't done anything. Yeah. So you do what you, and, and, except the people who are dead. And they're right. like, okay, in that situation, you can talk to me. Yeah. So I don't know if it related to your comment, but where you have a, a situation that's still very raw and there's some forgiveness you want to ask, there might be some forgiveness you want to give to get them to do it right, to get yeah. the benefits of it. Does it require action? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like extending forgiveness or requesting it as opposed to just thinking about it. I think there's stages and phases. I don't know the answer to that. Yes. And, and I don't either. But, you know, in in this text, what we see, it's really interesting. Um, again, you get to really get a sense of the inner workings of the Sangha. Um, and once a month, they go over every precept, right? So right now we're up to 120 precepts. <laughs> there's like quite a lot of things you're not supposed to do. And they chant each one. And if any member of the Sangha has actually like broken a precept they confess in front of the whole group and i think that word confess i know it's translated i've seen it in other buddhist texts it, it's it is translated as confess but it has such a a weight in our culture like a confession right That's like yeah as opposed to asking forgiveness which i think it actually has more of a quality of um but you know yeah, repenting. I mean, all of these, they, they feel really heavy. Um, and I love, I love this idea in, in the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. It is like, you're always being asked to repent or sorry, confess your neurotic thought crimes, like really get them out there. And it's not even maybe for the person or for like, you know, why are you getting up? It's like, it's so that they aren't in you hidden. So I think, I think with, you know, your question. And again, there's no you know, right answer other than are you moving towards whatever is more aligned with the way, right? And the way is more of peace, more of freedom. So is holding in your asking of forgiveness more aligned than asking forgiveness? And in some cases, um, you know, it can be really hard to ask forgiveness of someone. It could actually create more challenge or difficulty. You got to be honest with yourself about that, right? Is is it the right time? You know, is it kind? All of those important questions. But I think genuinely having that inquiry for ourselves around, um, you know, these questions, and maybe we have an insight like Cage had of, wow, my role in this, right? I, I see my role in it, and we don't need to even talk to someone about it. We recognize that we kind of implement it. Other times it might make sense to, to really to like put it to words. And I think in, uh, you know, I think you, you're supposed to ask three times for forgiveness, if I remember correctly from Hebrew school. And if they, they still say no the third time, you're, you're, you're good. So you have to ask three times. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's such a powerful thing to do. There's a, not a lot of good modeling of people asking forgiveness or like how to apologize well. I know there are professional apology organizations that help big corporations apologize. <laughs> are fascinating, right? There's professional apologists, but for most of us, it's pretty awkward, right? And, you know, apology is really tender, like recognizing that we've done harm, even if we didn't intend it. I just think if that gets you closer to true self-awareness, it's really amazing along the path. If it's really like an egoic show, might be not needed, right? So your intention with it matters so much too. Thanks for your question. Oh yeah, saw one hand in the back and then five. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, so for me, I think when you asked us to, to think of someone or a difficult person at first, I was like, I don't think I have any grudges. I don't think there's anyone I need to forgive. And 
but then someone very difficult <laughs> popped into my head and then like kind of these like subconscious thoughts were coming up where it was like blocking, like, no, not mm-hmm. ready, not ready, not ready. And, yeah. um, and then another person came up, um, and I, yeah, they were sitting across from me and I was having a conversation and, um, and you, you just spoke a little bit ago about the, like opening your heart and how this helps to open the heart. And I was, I, I was coming from a place of, I feel like logical compassion, of, mm. you know, like. I get it. I get the space that you were in and I can, you know, um, forgive that and, um, and kind of the actions in that way, but it didn't feel like this, um, very heartfelt, genuine kind of heart to heart, like connection. And, um, I just, I wonder if that comes with more practice or if you have thoughts on that. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, kind of refinement of the experience because totally right. Did, did other folks have that experience, but it was like transactional, like, mm-hmm. yep, I get it. You had all this stuff. Yeah. Like you're, you know, and you know, I have compassion for that, but it's coming like from the head, like not from the belly and the heart. Mm-hmm. And I think there is a level of like self-protection, right. That might prevent us from that opening. And I do think it can take time. And it can be feel very rote or kind of just like, I'm just doing this because I think this is a good idea, but I don't really feel it right now, but it's still a good step. Mm -hmm. And I do think it can take a while to, especially if we have felt quite wrong by someone to open our heart to them. It's very unintuitive. Mm -hmm. We really almost also have to believe that keeping our heart closed has a cost. Right. Because when I think of opening our heart with compassion, like, of course, it's good for that other being, but actually, like, it's really good for us because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious for you, like in thinking of this other person, like. What is that weight like? What is it like to have that that grudge or that grievance? Like, do you feel because you first you didn't you couldn't think of anyone. <laughs> so, like, I guess it doesn't come up often, but mm-hmm. like, yeah, what is the discomfort of that or to be curious about the discomfort of that? Yeah, I mean, I guess full disclosure, it's my mom and I love my mom and we have a, a good relationship and that's why it wasn't right immediate. And, um, you know, it's not like a daily thing. And yeah. um, but it was like kind of going back, like, yeah. you know, 40 years ago, whatever. And so I was like, oh, whoa, that's there. Yeah. And, you know, and, and trying to see almost like I was talking with her at that point in her life, mm. not her now. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think it is interesting because I was, I was like wondering, like, I wonder how often this comes up, like subconsciously in my relationship with my mom, you know, like how, um, she's a lovely person and she's so kind, but like, am I still like yeah. kind of harboring some sort of, yeah. you know, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. so that's an interesting thing because it's not like a, a one-off, like, Oh, I yeah. wrote this person off. Yeah. They're out of my life. I can't stand them. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, um, I can totally relate and resonate. And I, I think a lot of folks, here too they had human parents um <laughs> it's like that kind of stuff and and i do it is really interesting and i actually think it's like the perfect example of when to keep practicing with it um because it is you know and, it, and it's definitely also probably example of not like mom i forgive you she was like what <laughs> right because then you'd have to go and say like do you remember all these ways that you did harm And sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes, especially depending on where our parents are in their life, like it's not appropriate or not appropriate, like wouldn't be helpful. Mm -hmm. So then it is like, it's actually our, ours, right. The way they live in us and this amazing opportunity that we get to, you know, I, I love saying this, but we can time travel. We can really change the past by bringing it forth in this present moment and holding it in compassion. So it's like, um, I really love that movie Inside Out. No one has seen that? And there's this image of like, you have all these memories and they're these glowing balls, Mm -hmm. right? Of different colors. And we have these ones from our past that might have this color that's a lot of pain or hurt. 
and we bring it into the light here, hold it with compassion, extend the compassion. And, you know, we actually can, it's not like we change the past, but we're changing the way that we retrieve that memory in the present. And so much of the research has shown that our present moment has more to do with our experience of our memory than when it happened. So we have that potential of bringing it forth with compassion. So, yeah, beautiful. And I, and it, especially, especially with family members, it takes a long time, <laughs> I think, or it can, but it's so worth it. My grandmother has been gone 20 years. Uh, I still work this practice with her. And it's like, why? And it's like, because it's still in me, right? Like it's ours, right? And we want more and more again to kind of peel back the layers and um, kind of get rid of whatever's in the way. So thank you so much. Thank you. Claudia. Yeah. Friends online, do you see that Claudia is here with us in person? Oh, come on. Don't put me on this path. <laughs> it's, so nice. it's, really, it's really nice to it's have you great. here. It's been quite a while. Great being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment and I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that when I, when we, I'm so glad that we started also with the self-compassion because um, it kind of, I was thinking about not a very deep wound like you recommended, but somehow it did evoke some deeper wounds. And I felt kind of sad, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, it, it was interesting because by seeing myself and having that compassion towards myself, there was a, a shift, there mm -hmm. was a change and I felt joy and I felt joy. So it was really nice. Mm. That was really nice. Beautiful. Um, the question though, when I started thinking about the person that I feel wronged me and kind of like, like you, you know, it was also kind of in the head, you know, and so I guess I got up because I did feel after having compassion for myself, like my heart did open mm -hmm. and I felt kinder and, you know, not having such a grudge against this person. But at the same time, it was transactional. It wasn't mm -hmm. really that heartfelt. Yeah. And my question to you is, I'm, I'm going to have to see this person again. And I mean, to what extent do you okay, try to have compassion towards that person, try to understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, you need, I mean, I need respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so where do you draw the line? I mean, I'm not going to be a doormat, mm -hmm. you know? So I guess that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you probably know the answer though. <laughs> well, I, well you, you said the practice. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. But I but I also need to set boundaries. Yeah. Truly. Right. And it's really hard when we have to actually see the person. Um, I think it can be great to practice compassionate boundaries from like 3000 miles away. You know, that's that's a lot more. We can be a lot more open. Um, but I, I still think, you know, preparing to see the person feeling compassion, like even as much as we can throughout the entire experience, having that compassion and remembering that, you know, compassion has its 999 arts, right? So it doesn't mean that if we're compassionate, then this person can do whatever they want with us, or we have to be very kind and caring. Our compassion can also be, you know, quite fierce, right? And, and quite clear. And, you know, I do think clear boundaries is very compassionate and knowing that. And it's interesting because there's one thing to set boundaries when we're pissed at someone. And there's one thing to set boundaries when it's really coming from this inner alignment with compassion, you know, like, no, that won't work for me instead of why would you even ask that? Right. So just that inner clarity and, and again, remembering to practice for ourselves and recognizing that it's hard um both that i think that oscillation is so essential yeah thank you yeah yes Jimmy. 
lately, whenever I think about the idea of forgiveness, I'm reminded of this article I, I read last year in, in Tricycle, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it was some really, really authentic Buddhist teacher. And he talked about that the idea of forgiveness, like, like we think about it in Western culture, isn't really in Buddhism in the fat in the, in the idea that that kind of forgiveness where um, we are absolved of our obligation, like you free, like like a bank would forgive right. a loan mm -hmm. and you no longer have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. Or like when I was a little boy and going to confession and I would confess my sins and I was absolved of the responsibility of the consequences for my sinful action. Mm -hmm. They were they were literally it was literally taken away. And that's not really how life is we are responsible for the consequences of our actions and so when i forgive someone i don't have the ability to absolve them mm -hmm. from the consequences of their harmful action towards me i simply stop feeling the anger and the resentment and the the need to blame them for the situation yeah because like was said earlier i mean there's always an element of me and my behavior in whatever harm comes to me yeah. from another person yeah. and in in this particular um meditation tonight I went to a big one. I went to a deep one because the, I mean, the last time I did this with you was a few years ago before COVID. And it was about my housemate mm. who leaves his clothes in the washer or the dryer all the time. And this is a guy I've known for many, many years. I love him deeply. We're really close, but it pisses me off when he does that. Right. And I have to like take his clothes out of the dryer, blah, 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 blah. This morning I was doing laundry. I got to the dryer stage and, his stuff, and we've had this conversation a zillion times. Right. And it's always been, you know, very, and I just, I just started laughing. It was no longer, it's no longer a thing, but it's, yeah. it's funny that it came up today. Yeah. And, and here we are. <laughs> Perfect teacher. But I didn't, I, you know, and I thought about going there with that. But that's like not even happening for me anymore. Yeah. So I went to this deep one and the deep one. And I imagined the person there. And I've gone, I've done a lot of this work over the last three years mm -hmm. around this particular scene. And um, and, it, and it was again, it was it wasn't. I cannot absolve them. Mm -hmm of the, the consequences of their behavior. They are going to experience the consequences of their behavior towards me and their behavior in general, because it's a general sort of behavior pattern for them. Um, but I can stop blaming them. I can stop analyzing them. I can stop feeling the anger and the resentment. It can ebb away. Mm. Um, and that's what the forgiveness process is for me. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I, I actually remember that when you were talking about that housemate years ago. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I think one thing also that you're not saying directly, but, you know, in aligned with the teachings is when we think about, you know, someone's karma, right? We, we can't change it for them. We can't take it away for them. But also when we are endorsing or engaging or kind of perpetuating negative thoughts that's our karma it's not theirs that's ours right and even if you don't you know believe in karma or don't believe in a worldview in which you know karma is part of it 
when we are in, you know, if you could see the impact of negative rumination, like on your body, we would not do it right. Negative rumination. Like if it showed up like bruises on your body, we would never do it. But internally, like the emotional distress, right, of endorsing anger and feeling frustration, like that is like a impact on our body, you know, heavily. So it's I think it's important to think of the the cost of this, you know, holding a grudge, even if it's that person's fault. We are responsible to and in some ways the victims of that negative rumination. And it's contagious, right? When we're like feeling negative and ruminating, like we will inadvertently take it out on others around us, right? And so it's it's good internal housekeeping to really, you know, not suppress, not be like, I'm going to pretend I'm not mad, <laughs> right? And that's why compassion is so beautiful because we're not we're not trying to just suppress our experience. We're opening so wide to it. There's so much space around it naturally just filled with love right yeah well you made me think of this and this is what i'm hearing um and i'm not gonna get this quite right uh, that holding a grudge is like taking something toxic and expecting somebody else mm -hmm. to feel bad yeah taking poison and expecting someone else to die yeah and mm -hmm. um and i have a friend who says that forgiveness is seeing that someone has the energy for change mm, beautiful thank you yeah yeah no i think it's uh I'm, i appreciate going with the the heavy hitters you know the the bigger issues um and working forgiveness with that that's like our high level practice and also this like low level stuff it's just everywhere it's really interesting. It really helps us kind of really see, especially those little grudges, how central we put ourselves in relation to the world, mm -hmm. right? Because we're right. Like, but if we're really right with like all these little things, you know, it's so funny. Um, you know, searching is a great example of this. Like whenever I find myself, whenever I'm out there, someone's always in my way. <laughs> right and like why are they paddling that way can't they see i'm paddling that way it's like just just like centralizing around my experience and being like so upset they could not recognize the primacy of me out there um so it's just it's really good to get onto ourselves um and and have some tools for the more heavy hitter stuff right um so i'm gonna dig in a little bit here so we're, we're bouncing around a bit because there's a couple good teachings across these chapters. Um, there's a, a part in um, chapter 43, um, and that chapter is called Everyone's Tears Are Salty. And one aspect of the, of the Buddha's path of awakening that I love is so beautifully highlighted by Thich Nhat Hanh is it's a path of liberation for all beings not a path of liberation for uh, noble born kings and princes, though a lot of them join the Sangha, the liberatory path is really, it transforms all of society at once. And so the, you hear in like the first, you know, years of the, of the Buddha Sangha, you'll have these, you know, noble princes who are joining right alongside, you know, a butcher or um, someone who's caring just for, uh, the, the fields or the farms. And that's already like, it's quite evocative. But in, um, you know, historical India, that at this time, there was a whole cast of untouchable beings, right? And in probably every society, in every culture, there are beings who we just, we don't include as part of, you know, they're not either, they're seen as either subhuman or a different level of human. And in this case, it was a very strong social order, like very strong social order. And the Buddha um, runs into someone who, this name Sunita, um, who he, he encounters and he kind of just has this, um, has this 
this sense of his awake nature. So when you become an enlightened being, you have all these kind of amazing capacities and potentials to see into other beings. And um, so he he's there and he's traveling um, from one of his new monasteries to another. And uh, um, let me see here. Da, da, da. Uh -huh. One day, as the Buddha and the bhikkhus were begging in a village near the banks of the Ganga, the Buddha spotted a man carrying night soil. The man was an untouchable named Sunita. He had heard about the Buddha, but this was the first time he'd ever seen them. He was alarmed, knowing how dirty his clothes were and how foul-smelling he was from carrying the night soil. He quickly moved off the path and made his way down to the river. But the Buddha was determined to share the way with Sunita. When he veered from the path, the Buddha did the same. Understanding the Buddha's intent, um, two of his main students, Sariputta and Megiya, uh, followed him. And the rows of other bhikkhus came to a halt, and they quietly watched. Sunita was panic-stricken. He hastily put the buckets of night soil down and looked for a place to hide. Above him stood the bhikkhus in their saffron robes, while before him approached the Buddha. Not knowing what else to do, he waded up to his knees in water and stood with his palms joined. Curious villagers came out of their homes and lined the shore to watch what was happening. Sunita had veered off the path because he was afraid he would pollute the bhikkhus. He could not have guessed the Buddha would follow him. Sunita knew the Sangha included many men from noble castes, and he was sure that polluting a bhikkhu was an unforgivable act. He hoped the Buddha and bhikkhus would leave him and return to the road. But the Buddha did not leave. He walked right up and he said, my friend, come closer so we may talk. And Sunita said, Lord, I don't dare. And the Buddha said, why, why not? I am untouchable. I don't want to pollute you and your monks. And the Buddha replied, on our path, we no longer distinguish between castes. You are a human being like the rest of us. We are not afraid. Only greed, hatred, and delusion can pollute us. A person as pleasant as yourself brings nothing but happiness. Um, and they go on a little bit longer, but he says, I've already explained that on our path, there's no caste in the way of awakening. This does not exist. Um, it is like the rivers, the Ganga, the Yamo, the Arkabati, the Sarabu, the Mahi and the Rohini rivers. Once they have emptied into the sea, they no longer retain their separate identities. A person who leaves home to follow the way uh, leaves their caste behind, whether they were born a Brahmin, a Kastriya, a Vasaya, a Sudra, or an untouchable. Sunita, if you like, you can become a bhikkhu like the rest of us. He said, no one has ever spoken to me so kindly before. It's the happiest day of my life. Uh, I will vow to devote my being to the practice of your teaching. And so this is um, an eventful moment. And, you know, it's interesting, like the Buddha was very aware of how public this was. The Sangha is now big enough that everything he is doing is kind of a public event. All of these kings have aligned themselves with the Buddha whenever he is in a specific land. Whatever the Buddha is doing catches the attention of the local people. And um, one of uh, one of his senior disciples uh, was was asking, you know, about what people's reaction might be to this. And the Buddha said, accepting untouchables into the Sangha was a question of time. Our way is of equality. We do not recognize caste. We may encounter difficulties over the ordination, but we will have opened a door for the first time in history. The future generations will thank us. We must have courage. And his, one of his senior students says, we do not lack courage or endurance, but how can we reduce the hostility of public opinion to make it easier for the bhikkhus to practice? Um, and so, and then, uh, the Buddha says the important thing is to remain trusting of our practice. I will strive to assist Sunita in making progress. His success will be our strongest argument. Um, and what they find is indeed the story of this, this incident kind of goes around and reaches all the different villages and then eventually reaches the King. And the King is very upset. You know, this is disrupting social order in a profound way. And he goes to visit the Buddha. And when he goes to visit the Buddha, he enters. This is a couple of weeks later. And one of the first thing he sees when he enters the forest is this monk who is, you know, in such a state of serenity, teaching other monks meditation. And he stops and he's kind of entranced by this monk. And this monk, of course, is Sunita. 
uh, uh, former untouchable. And so he comes to the Buddha and says, who is that like wonderful teacher? And he says, it's a Sunita he came to us a couple of weeks ago. And just that evidence, um, it's so important. And uh, still an issue of contention is he doesn't, he continues to think it's not plausible to accept women into the Sangha at this point. That would be even more disruptive to social order and create more difficulty than this kind of upheaval of the caste system. And the Buddha's stepmother is the first one who's just pleading with the Buddha, like, please, I know you know that we are all equal. Can you accept women? And he's too afraid to do so. And it takes his, his stepmother and 80 other women walking 100 miles barefoot and then showing up where the Buddha is teaching next and pleading slash demanding to be let in, that the Buddha is willing to take that kind of heat and intensity. Um, and it's and the way that the women are let in is they're let in only with these very specific regulations and rules that women are below men. Very uncomfortable aspect of this story for me, um, though the way that Thich Nhat Hanh writes it, which I appreciate, is that it was understood that these would shift and change once they're, you know, the Sangha had matured and things and times had changed. Still, we experience that there's quite a lot of uh, male dominant hierarchy in many spiritual traditions and um, we have come a long way, but uh, it's it's just interesting to think that, you know, we don't have an official caste system, but we certainly don't value all citizens the same. I'll forget citizens, all humans the same in this country or others. Um, and that part of this path of awakening isn't, you know, just us uprooting all of our stuff, but it's uprooting, you know, the greed and ignorance and hatred that underlies our social structures. Uh, and opposing them, right, internally and also externally as much as we can do so. And just I very much appreciate the invitation throughout this book to be reminded that the path of awakening is, an indiv is not an individual journey. Not only is it done in the Sangha, but it is done explicitly to like overturn the ways of being that actually get in the way, right, that are, um, that are not compassionate and not kind. Home, yeah. I was gonna. I'll have to share a little bit more next week about the conflicts that uh, that are arising in the sangha at this time as well. Um, that inspired us to work on forgiveness today. But um, let's take a moment and dedicate the merit here together. So just like our intention is the guiding light of the practice, the merit is in some ways the gold of our practice. It's the richness of anything that we may have felt or touched in the course of our time here together. When making this symbolic but heartfelt offering that anything that we have benefited from in our time here together, we offer it up. We extend it out to other beings. We imagine that there's a possibility that something in our time here together could radiate and be of benefit so that all beings would know peace and belonging. All beings would know freedom from suffering. That all beings could be healthy and strong so that all beings could be free. Thanks everyone for your practice and presence and reflections.